So few plant species grow only with their own species. In the real world, there's competition between species, interspecific competition. Natural plant populations are mixtures of not only two, but multiple species. From the plant's eye view, the spatial arrangement of individuals around it are important, and that's what affects interspecific competition. There are different kinds of neighbors that might provide interference or competition. Could be parts of the same genetic individual, tillers or ramets, and so we could have A1, one genotype versus itself, A1. There could be different genotypes of the same species, A1 versus A2. These could be siblings or very unrelated. And then there are genets of different taxa, A versus B, as well as indirect effects of one type of plant on another. So how plants are spaced affects how they compete. If the spacing is equidistant, then there's a maximum potential for competition between species. Intraspecific competition within a species diminishes the effects of a stronger species on a weaker species. That's why we have to consider both intra- and interspecific effects. In the real world, distribution of most species is non-random. And the weaker competitors are favored when plants are clumped because there are other, com other plants competing with others that takes a little of the pressure off the weaker plants. But it's a function of time that as plants rooted in one spot get bigger, they get closer to their neighbors. And so time is correlated with distance inversely. So two things are confounded or connected to each other. The distance plants are apart and the times that they get established. A plant that grows earlier can get bigger faster. So there have been some simple experiments to look at the effects of time and space. Competition between a forb, a broad-leafed herb, Plantago lanceolata, and a grass, Lolium perenni, were conducted three treatments in which the first one in which they were seeds of both were sown at the same time. One treatment in which Plantago was sown three weeks before Lolium and the other treatment where Lolium was sown three weeks before Plantago. So here are some little charts that illustrate the results, kind of puny they turned out, but anyway the chart on the left shows the number of established tillers per plant or plants per species. In the middle is what happens when they were grown together, similar numbers of tillers. When lolium was planted first, there are many more tillers than those of plantago, and when plantago was planted first, there's more plantago. And on the right is the difference in mean dry weight of each species per plot. So you can see that even if the numbers are similar when they're planted together, the biomass of the grass, lolium, was much greater also when it was planted first. But when plantago got a jump on things, its biomass ended up much greater. The first kind of competition experiments were what I would call additive experiments, where you have a constant number of species A and then increasing amounts of another species. Really, this is probably the most like what happens in nature, but proportional composition and the density of the mixture are both changed at the same time, so it's hard to tell which is more important. But you can see here a graph of species A growing by itself, the diamonds with the red line, when increasing amounts of other species are added, 
you can see that C and D both have depressing effects on on A, because on the y-axis is the dry weight of A. But look at what happens with B. It seems to actually benefit, because the biomass of A is greater when growing with B. An ecologist named DeWitt came up with a substitutive design. That these have been come to be known as DeWitt replacement series, where you have two species, keeping the overall density constant, you change the proportions and then you can look at the yield curves that is how much biomass results in the different mixtures to show the effects of each species on the other one. So in this case here we see the proportion of I increasing and you can say in the other direction that's the proportion of J increasing. So when there's no I there's all J, that's the yield. When there's no all J, there's no I, and that's the total yield. So if there's no interference or equal effects, the results will look something like this, with each species contributing to the total yield in direct proportion of the sown seed. So you can predict the yield of the mixture from the yield of the pure stands. In this case, you can see the effect of I on J is greater than the effect of J on itself. And the effect of J on I is less than the effect of I on I. So J being present relieves I from self-competition. Still, the yield is predictable from the yield of the pure stands, that is, these, these two things, this and this, add up to this. If interspecific competition is stronger than intraspecific competition, the effect of I on J is greater than J on itself, the effect of J on I greater than I on itself, we have mutual antagonism. And when they're grown together, the yield of the mixture is depressed over what it would be if grown separately. So this shows each species is more destructive to the other than it is to individuals of its own species. But we can have the other effect too where intraspecific is much more important in both species. So each species suffers less in the presence of the other than expected but this can also happen if the presence of one promotes the growth of the other. So you can see this is greater than the expected yield. Jake Weiner, who did those in size inequality experiments we talked about before, also looked at interspecific competition between lolium and trifolium, the grass and the broadleafed herb. He found that in different fertilizer combinations, lolium benefited and trifolium suffered from the presence of lolium. That's probably because trifolium as a legume may have been fixing nitrogen. Interestingly, the grass showed decreased inequality in the mixture, whereas trifolium showed increased inequality. The winners got more equal, the losers less so. Our textbook has some nice diagrams showing experiments carried out by Richards and colleagues in the Finbos of South Africa where a number of different Proteaceae species compete with one another in the same habitat and they did an experiment planting seedlings of the different species in the presence of mixtures versus monocultures of the different species. By planting the species in habitats where they didn't occur naturally, they saw that all of the species 
did best when planted within their natural range for survival and biomass. The green bars indicate for each species where they were in their natural environment. Interestingly, the seedlings were a little more flexible and did a little better at in the intermediate sites as well. And for all of these, the plants in mixtures performed a little better, probably because interspecific competition was less than intraspecific competition. So for any little broadleaf plant in a meadow full of grasses, it's a jungle. The grasses easily outcompete them for herbs trying to compete with grasses. Interestingly, not only when they're alive, there's competition when they're living, but Joy Bergelson found that many grasses um, remain the dead plant body, hogs space on the ground, and then keeps seedlings from uh, seeds from other plants from germinating or establishing. So she called this phenomenon life after death. And I think this is kind of appropriate with Halloween coming to think about this.